This is a basic introduction into school finance uh, and what a board member's responsibilities are relative to those finances. Good financial planning and management through the budget process can add, add to the instructional quality of the school. Without the finances, it's hard to provide the curriculum and the instruction necessary to uh, develop outstanding educational opportunities for students. The budget aspect controls cost. It's basic considerations and provides the information to the public and to the administration as to what the board's direction is relative to instruction. The budget becomes an aid or a guide as to where you want the academy to go. It establishes sound fiscal uh, policy and it sets the limits for fiscal responsibility that the board wants for the academy. The administration is responsible to carry out that plan fiscally as laid out by the board. Legislation concerning budget budgeting process is very explicit and in detail under the school code, some of which we will get into as we go through this presentation. The budget is a tool by which you look at the future and forecast what might be. Student enrollment is critical. The majority of the funding for the academy is driven off from student enrollment and the state foundation grant for each of those students eligible for count. Categorical grants are enhancement grants to help boards look at achieving specific goals within the educational structure. Federal grants also give the board opportunities to attack areas that might be in need of critical uh, instructional processes. Local sources on the academy side usually are grants that come in from outside agencies or from local foundations that support your program and mission. In developing the budget, expenditures are the key uh, are a key factor. Expenditures help define what you're going to be spending and where you're going to be spending those funds. Determining staff needs for salaries, fringes, and how many staff members are going to be needed for the students that you're forecasting enrollment. Contracted services. You have lease agreements with uh, landlords if you don't own the building or you have bonds that need to be paid which are required that funds be set aside for. You have uh, management agreements for the educational services being provided. You have other contracts that might dictate uh, in advance where money is going to be spent and how it's going to be spent. Supplies and materials. These are items that are needed uh, in order to carry out the instructional uh, efforts which you as a board feel are of high importance. Equipping the classroom, equipping the building in order to provide a functional and effective educational process. The school code lays out legal requirements in the adoption of a budget. You must adopt a budget for the general fund. If you have a food services program, you would be adopting a special revenue fund. And if you have a bond for either equipment or facilities, you would need to uh, develop a debt fund and adopt a budget accordingly. Budgets are required to conform with state and national uh, accounting principles and are laid out in specific format in order for um, individuals looking at these uh, budgets can compare budgets uh, from one ent uh, school entity to the next. Uh, the revenue side of the budgets are laid out in uh, four main areas. The first one uh, is a 100 level uh, 
factor, which is for local revenues that might come in. Again, for academies, these uh, would be revenues being donated to the school by uh, local community groups, foundations, uh, other interested individuals. 300 level would be for state funds that come in, primarily the uh, per student foundation grant is the majority of where those funds will be accounted for. You also have the possibility of some categorical funds that might come in that would be accounted for under this level. The 400 level will be for federal grants, Title I and Title II are the most common uh, that would be coming into an academy. 500 uh, is called an incoming transfer level. This would be funds that would come in from another agency uh, that is also uh, considered uh, you know, public agency, such as in the school district uh, that supports the uh, special education, usually uh, expenditures that a school might encounter. On the expenditure side, these are a little greater detail breakdown in that you have the instructional side, which uh, are primarily in an academy level or found in two basic uh, areas. In the 110 area, these are for basic programs. These are programs that take place within the four walls of a classroom. It's the teachers' expenditures for salary fringes. It's the cost of uh, materials and supplies and equipment that go into that classroom. In the 120 level, these are what are called added needs areas. And primarily in the academy level, uh, schools would be a special education uh, would fall primarily under this group. Uh, at the secondary level, if you have vocational programs, those would fall under uh, the 120 level. Getting into the support services area, these start with a 200 uh, level. And then 210, these are for pupil support services. Primarily these services uh, are in the special education area for uh, social work, psychologists, uh, those types of uh, added costs that bring in consultants from the outside to work with students. The uh, next level will be uh, the 220 level, which are instructional su support services. And these would be primarily for uh, the where the deans would, uh, if the school has the dean model, where supervisors or directors would be charged. Uh, again, these would be uh, not the school director or school leader, but these would be individuals that would be overseeing programs within the school operations. Uh, it would also include professional development for the staff. In the 230 level, uh, this is uh, expenditures that are associated with the Board of Education or General Administration. Some board uh, expenditure line items might be for the um, authorizer contract uh, payments. This would also be for uh, legal services, auditing services, uh, general administration would be, uh, again, limited if you have a structure whereby you have a superintendent and a building principal, the superintendent would be charged at this level. If you have only one person, which in majority of the academies you have the building principal, uh, is also the superintendent, uh, chief administrative officer, they would go down in the 240 level when you only have one person. When you have two individuals, one being the superintendent and another individual that's over the school itself, then the school administration uh, is in the 240 level is where the individual would be recorded because this would be their primary function is actually giving direction to uh, and providing support of the instructional programs there at the school site. Uh, usually an educational service provider uh, would be the primary general administration providing the services that uh, uh, of a superintendent uh, nature or central office nature. Uh, the 250 uh, level would be for business services. Again, uh, these would be primarily fu funded through the uh, ESP contract and would have very 
a uh, few charges going in here. Uh, operations and maintenance would be under a 260 level. These would be for custodians. And if you have a contracted service for providing custodial services, this is where the contract cost and uh, any uh, materials for custodial supplies or anything else that the board would be responsible for would be charged. The transportation, uh, if you have transportation provider, whether you do it contracted or via your own service, charges for transportation would all, uh, be put in here. Also under the 260 level, I kind of uh, skipped on that. If you have a contracted service for uh, or the lease, and the lease includes uh, maintenance and uh, other operations such as utilities and such, that would go under the 260 level, that particular cost. 280 is central services. Again, most of these services are handled through your ESP contract and could very well be showing up under the 230 level. Community services are rare, but those would be for activities you might hold uh, of a community nature that in some cases are funded from outside sources. Other financing uses, uh, very generic, but again, it would include monies that you might be transferring over to the uh, school services fund to support uh, the food service program or uh, monies that you transfer to a debt fund to cover uh, bonds that you might have outstanding for a purchase of equipment or uh, purchase of a, a school facility. The state has re rules and regulations as well as laws on the books under the school code pertaining to the violation of the Uniform Budgeting and Accounting Act. Uh, the Uniform Budgeting and Accounting Act is what governs uh, school funding and financial reporting in the state of Michigan. Uh, basically, it stipulates that if you spend without proper authority or sufficient budget, or you divert funds for purposes inconsistent with the school code, and those purposes are specifically dictated towards the providing and furthering of educational programs for children. It doesn't say anything about uh, providing amenities for adults, but it is specifically aimed at children and their educational opportunities. Violation of the Uniform Budgeting and Accounting Act could result in civil action uh, by the state against individual board members or the board collectively as a whole. There are misdemeanor penalties laid out that uh, include uh, up to a 90 days in jail for chief uh, officers, which would include the president or treasurer of the board, uh, and or 1,500 hours in fines. Um, in extreme cases, prosecution could result if there is found to be misspending or misappropriations of these funds willfully and wantonly. Uh, and those prosecutions would be turned over usually to local authorities or possibly the state attorney general's office. Uh, adopting a budget. In adopting a budget, the details that support each of the line item areas should be provided to the board when considering and looking at the budget. When you're looking at a salary account level, number of individuals that would be included, such as number of teachers, number of paraeducators, along with any supplies, materials, and equipment should all be broken down for the board, not necessarily by individual, but at least by quantity. So if nine teachers are in that line, line item along with uh, five paraeducators, should be well spelled out so that way you have an idea and knowledge of what's contained. The School Aid Act also prohibits the adoption of a deficit budget. And adopting a deficit budget means that you have no fund equity, which you can fall back on in hard times. If you are at zero balance when you enter the year, it means you have to be zero balance at the end of the next year that, that you're uh, adopting the budget for. If you have a fund balance, it gives you a little leeway uh, during a year in which you want to put emphasis on some acquisition of additional equipment or uh, technology, uh, but it does not allow you at the end of that year to wind up anything greater than zero. 
budgets must be presented uh, at the beginning of the before the beginning of the school year. July first to June thirtieth is considered the ca school calendar year. Normal pro process would be the presentation of a budget uh, to the board by the ESP or the administrative staff in May with discussions and considerations um, being given to the board for a period of time to ask questions or study the details. Uh, adoption of the budget would be in June, before June 30th, with implementation on July 1st. Failure to adopt the budget by July 1st uh, does not pr allow the board then to uh, issue uh, checks uh, or write checks uh, for purposes of continuing their operations. Uh, budget must be in place before funds can be spent. This does not include, though, those checks being uh, payroll checks being issued to 10 month staff that are being paid over a 12 month period. You must have a public hearing before any adoption. Public hearing notice must be uh, published in, uh, <coughs> for uh, individual community members to know that uh, public hearing is going to be held and discussions on the budget uh, are going. They also have a right to a copy of the budget if so requested. Once the budget is adopted, amendments to the budget must be made before any expenditures can be made that would exceed a given line item or that would be in areas where there were no budget originally provided. Uh, budget amendments should also be made periodically in order to keep the board administration and community up to date on what is taking place relative to educational spending of funds that have been received. Implementing the budget. It is the chief administrative officer's responsibility. This would be, again, the director, CAO, superintendent, whatever the title might be that an academy gives to their uh, person in charge, uh, has a responsibility to implement the budget plan and to see that it is carried out according to the board's adoption. Only the board has the right, and again, this is the full board. This is not one individual, but this is a majority of the board that has the right to alter the budget. Budgetary control is a joint responsibility between the chief administrative officer and the board treasurer and other board members secondarily. Monitoring of the budget. The board should receive monthly financial reports. Those reports should show at least the monthly expenditures uh, for a given line item the year-to-date expenditures in that line item, and a comparison to the budget for that line item, and uh, the final column at least should show them the available balance within that budget. Any line item that has a negative figure showing should then be questioned and possible revisions to the budget be made in order to eliminate deficit spending in a given line item. Quarterly cash flows should be given to the board showing that there are funds and how the funds are available to meet uh, outgoing expenditures that are that are being presented or uh, encumbered at, on each given month. Quarterly budget updates should be made. Uh, they should then reflect any changes that the ESP or the administrative staff sees that were not anticipated back in June uh, when the original budget was put together. The budget should then be adjusted so that way when the adding audit is taken it does not show any major differences between what was adopted and what was uh, expended. Knowing how to read your financial reports is again critical. Financial reports are should be basically simple for the board uh, and the public to read and to understand. They should be, again, as I said earlier, put out, put out with a minimum of four columns, with the first column showing the current monthly expenditure, second column the year-to-date total expenditures for that line item, third column with the budget that uh, is being uh, appropriated for that particular line category, 
and then the fourth column showing what uh, available balances there are within that budget. Uh, you should have financial reports for the general fund, which is the most common and probably the and will be the should be the most used fund. School services fund, which would be again primarily uh, the food services group of accounts. Student activity funds. These are funds that students or PTAs raise for the benefit of the school for specific purposes that would be outside the funding that you would get for uh, or through the general fund for the student foundation or categorical uh, aid. These funds could be used specifically to provide for field trips, for activities such as uh, contributing money to the needy in the community, uh, providing for uh, specialized items that uh, a group or students might want to raise money in order to achieve a goal. The board becomes the banker for the PTA or the school group and accounts for that money to make sure that, uh, again, it is properly recorded and accounted for when expended. Cash flow forecasts, again, should be given to the board on a fairly uh, regular basis, a minimally of a quarter quarterly basis, in order to show that the school is, again, operating within its means of revenues coming in, expenditures going out. Oversight of the different funds, the student activity funds, PTA funds, federal and local grants, again, as I've indicated, become full responsibility of the board. Uh, you have parents who take a strong interest in the school and support the school, but they should not be left to um, have to take full responsibility for uh, accounting and uh, handling of those funds. Those, those monies should be deposited regularly with the Board of Education and accounted for. And again, with proper um, setup of responsibilities would be uh, guaranteed that they will be there at the time of need. The Board is the trustee of the public's money. Uh, so you need to have strong fiscal policies which then reflect the concern and the oversight given to where the funds are and how they're being spent. Red flags that would create concerns for you is that if your administration or your ESP does not provide you with monthly financial reports, fully disclosing how much money is coming in and where that money is being spent. Again, you as a board are responsible for every dollar that comes in and every dollar that goes out. Summary uh, reports, uh, again, could be considered and should be considered uh, insufficient information in order for you to make proper decisions. When spending exceeds a line item budget greater than 10%, there should be questions being asked as to why there are not a budget uh, adoption uh, amendment being presented. First question might be, why are we overexpended in that line item? And why haven't we been then presented with a proper amendment? Segregation of duties is critical. You should have information from your ESP if they are handling all your funds uh, for revenue uh, receipt and revenue expenditure uh, or through the administration staff as to who is responsible for receiving the money, how are they being recorded, and what evidence is being given to you of that recording. Also, when checks are being written to pay for bills or obligations of the academy, who is writing that check, where do they have, what do they have access to, and who is overseeing that individual to make sure that they're not writing checks that are not applicable to your specific academy. ESPs who handle more than one school sometimes uh, might mix or commingle funds, which is not really uh, appropriate uh, action and needs to be segregated for each individual school and you should have the assurances that that is happening for your specific school. When revenues are slow coming in, you should be asking questions as to why. On the school aid side, uh, the state doesn't pay the first school aid uh, payment 
for the fiscal year until October 20th. Uh, that starts the clock on the 11 payments you're going to receive from the state starting in October going all the way through to uh, the uh, August. <clears throat> you should see regular income coming in for the grants uh, that are under the state categorical as well as the uh, student foundation allowance. When it comes to federal or other grant monies that are out there that uh, you've uh, qualified for, those have to be done under a regular application process either to the state or to the ISD and those should be done on a minimally on a quarterly basis in order to ensure that the school board funds are coming in in a timely manner to meet expenditures that you have obligations for under those grants. In order to minimize your risk, if you as a board, you know where the funds and the school funds are deposited, and yet you receive periodic reviews by uh, reviewing bank statements. Uh, you should know what bank, what financial institution your funds are deposited to, and uh, out of what institution are they coming out, and you should be able to see a detailed itemization, uh, again, periodically, doesn't necessarily have to be every month, but should be at least quarterly. The board treasurer should be charged with reviewing at least once a quarter all documents that resulted in a check being processed against board funds. Likewise, should also be able to review deposits that come in to support the writing of those checks. You might want to avoid risk by curtailing the use of credit cards and other credit instruments such as um, purchase cards. Uh, these can be abused if not uh, if you do not have good fiscal uh, responsible outlines and guidelines governing the use of these instruments. The state uh, also points out that there are prohibited expenditures for which uh, school designated funds can be used. Again, these are under the uh, state, local, and federal monies coming in. Uh, that are specifically identified for the school and instructional purposes. You cannot purchase items for personal use. Individuals who would go out and spend money that uh, results in items being used both in the classroom and for their personal use is considered personal use expenditure and cannot be reimbursed or paid for by the school. Items purchased must be specifically for the school and school use only. Refreshments being purchased for employees during regular working hours is prohibited. Again, there are gray areas of this. When you have a professional development day and you have coffee and juice and uh, a fruit plate or um, bakery goods provided for that professional development activity, these are acceptable expenditures for that specific activity. Providing coffee all day long for all staff members without them contributing to the cost of that coffee is one of the items that is prohibited. Contributions to charitable and nonprofit organizations. Again, uh, you can have fundraisers to bring in money to, uh, say, buy turkeys for the needy at Thanksgiving or Christmas or buy cl uh, clothing for the needy com uh, community members. You cannot use monies that are designated under the school uh, funding for the state uh, foundation grant, categoricals, federal monies coming in for these purposes. Again, that's uh, primarily why you would have a student activity or PTA fund set up so that way those monies can be collected for the specific purpose and then used for that specific purpose. Again, school monies that are designated for instructional purposes cannot be used for contributions. You cannot purchase uh, presents for the uh, school officials or uh, employees. Uh, m again, minimally uh, good sense if you uh, purchase a plaque for recognition of service or outstanding uh, work. Uh, those are minimal in nature, but to buy a plaque and then give a gift certificate or gift card or cash reward using school funds is prohibited. Flowers for sick or departed uh, 
relatives or employees is prohibited uh, use of school uh, designated funds. Again, all the uh, more reason why you might have a activity fund set up where people can contribute to to uh, cover these kinds of expenditures or activities. The oversight and management of school finances through a strong budgeting process can determine whether you win or lose the curriculum and how well you monitor those expenditures will determine how successful you are in devoting yourself towards instructional quality. One of the other things that we are facing in today's current economics situation is that we are being faced with a continual level of funding with no increases for inflation or outside uh, factors that are increasing our daily costs. So one of the things that becomes critical for both administration and boards is to collectively think about how we can creatively approach the same goal and that's high performing instructional programs by looking at the ordinary and trying to see what we can do on the extraordinary. Looking at every act as a creative act and trying to be creative in how we look at things now and as we move forward. There's more than one right answer. You should refrain from looking at problems as being a reason to micromanage versus as problems being an opportunity to give the administration and staff the opportunity to explore new venues and creative ways of accomplishing high educational standards. The other thing is, when you make a decision, don't be afraid if that decision leads to a mistake. Mistakes sometimes open up a, a whole new venue of opportunities by looking at the mistake and saying, gee, if we would do this or this or this, we could really expand further. Break patterns. A lot of times we get comfortable with what we're doing and how we're doing, and that leads to complacency. One of the things that, as a board member, the reason why you are serving is because you really care about the educational instruction and activities provided to the students that you are responsible for. One of the ways to keep yourself as a board member out of problems with the uh, authorizer or with the state or the federal government is to know your charter contract and the financial requirements within that charter contract. There are specific uh, responsibilities that are laid out as a board that you must conform to and that you must be knowledgeable of. Failure to do so could lead to revocation of a charter by your authorizer or possible individual re recommendations that individual board members be removed from the board as being fiscally irresponsible. You should also note your educational service provider contract agreement. They have specific items spelled out in there that they are going to provide for you and at what expense make sure that they are delivering those expectations and that they are being paid appropriately for what they are delivering. Lease agreements. Lease agreements tend to be sometimes the downfall for the financial well-being of a academy. Sometimes these lease agreements become inclusive in that uh, not only are you paying for leasing the premises, but you're also paying all the utilities, taxes, maintenance, and expenses that in some respects in a good lease agreement, the landlord would be responsible at a fair price for many of the costs. If it's a minimal lease agreement and you take care of all the other expenditures, that's one thing. If it's a expensive lease agreement and then on top of that you're responsible for all the other costs that go into occupying that facility, you might want to look at how you can 
improve on that in future uh, negotiations with your landlord. In the end, when the board members effectively govern and the school leaders and staff effectively manage the school finances, the student performance becomes a major focus, which is what we should be about.